Hello and welcome to my presentation on the Nut Island Effect Revisited, an application of social distance factors to distant team behaviors. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about the Nut Island Effect. I'm going to define what it is, the key characteristics of the Nut Island Effect, the different stages that a team goes through when it exhibits these, this, this effect, and recommendations for reducing the impact of this Nut Island Effect on the team. The Nut Island Effect is defined basically as a condition in which distant team behavior becomes destructive due to a deteriorated relationship between the management and the team. In this case, I'm talking about distant teams such that their teams in which face-to-face -face interperson communication is not possible. Once upon a time, physical distance was deemed to be a factor, but actually it is not. You can have people, I've personally seen individuals within 30 feet of each other they lived, they worked in a cubicle and didn't never saw each other and they even suffered some of these effects over time so this deterioration becomes amplified as a social distance which basically is a perceived psychological distance between two entities the social distance between the team and management increases over time this increased social distance begins to cause long-term damage to a relationship between the distant team, distant team and management. And the two factors that are involved in this are communication quality and time. Communication quality provides important social and context cues in which a person uses to understand the context of where they're at and their social position within a larger team. We usually discuss this as socialization cues. These are very important in team building and in maintaining long-term relationships within a team. And time influences relationship by deteriorating the effects of communication. The longer the communication, the span between communication occurs, the effectiveness of that communication will slowly decrease. And in some cases, if it goes to a point of no return, the social cues and the messages can actually be viewed negatively. We call this in-group versus out-group biases in which if this is not taken care of, a, a seemingly positive message or positive context by a manager will actually be viewed negatively by the team. So the key characteristics of the Nut Island Effect. First, you have a dedicated and cohesive team. In my experience, you may bring people from many different locations together in a different location, and they may have the same background. The same background forms a sort of a shared identity, which is very important in team behavior because the shared identity helps everyone within the team understand each other. The shared identity is used for communication to help define certain cues that would not otherwise be understood but because there is a shared identity this helps with communication and creating the social bonds this also discourages non-aligned behaviors people who are outsiders to a team will quickly realize that they are outsiders because the strong socialization cues basically tell the entire team what is expected of people to be within the team so you may have sub teams within a larger team of people that have shared identity and also a sh uh, also shared goal identity in many cases the shared identity and the shared goal identity are very similar so you have to be very careful or they can also be very different also what happens over time is the team becomes homogenous and what i mean is the team becomes a single entity that has this single shared identity and shared vision. And because the manager neglects the relationship with the team, they develop a high level of, the, of autonomy. And the manager actually, in many cases, likes this because if they have a high level of autonomy, then they don't have to get involved. The team takes care of things themselves, so the manager can chase off high priority problems which as you're going to see later in this presentation causes more problems than it solves so these factors increase in-group versus out-group biases and what happens is what in-group and out-group biases are in-group biases is basically anything that occurs within a team in which shares the same goals and the same vision 
are viewed positively and anything that occurs outside this group is viewed negatively. So in many cases, a manager who, if they become part of the out group, now this is psychological. This is very important to understand this. If the team views the manager psychologically as an out group person, those communications from the manager, no matter how well-meaning the manager may may think he is communicating, will be viewed negatively. I've seen managers go to sites and have a happy face, and the team is basically just doing whatever they can to get this manager away because he's an outgroup person. So everything that he said is actually viewed negatively, even though the manager means well. Uh, which is not fair to the manager, but this is just a this is a psychological side effect. And this is just the way humans are wired. This autonomy is usually caused by manager distraction rather than the team capability. The team can be mediocre in performance, but because there's no signals coming back to the manager, the manager's like, well, the team has it. They, I'm just going to get in get in the way if I do anything. So the manager decides to just keep distant and view and work on other high priorities. As you're going to see, this is very dangerous to a team's performance and to the team's relationship to the manager. So as I said, you also have distracted management. The management slowly begins to address priorities that are other than the team because the team is autonomous. We leave the team alone because they're getting things done. Unfortunately, the team, the manager also decides not to maintain relationships with the team as well which causes other problems because if the manager does not maintain the relationship, then these in-group versus out-group biases and the autonomy of the team becomes stronger and stronger. And as you're going to see in the model, it's going to amplify these effects. And the management distraction is amplified with additional management layers. The further up the management tree the manager is, the harder it is for the manager to reinforce social and psychological cues with the distant team. And that's because everyone's got different priorities. It's hard for a manager that's three levels up who may have a hundred different teams to focus on each team. That's why it's important for the team manager to maintain a relationship so it's easier for the larger management group to also have a relationship with the team. And as you're going to see, it's going to affect what we call organizational citizenship behaviors. It's basically how the team views the organization and how the team behaves on the organization's behalf. These in-group, as in-group and out-group biases become diverse, uh, divergent, the organizational citizenship behaviors are, are going to be divergent as well. They begin to, to, to do things without considering the company. And as a result, and I've seen this a hundred times at least, the employees begin to view the company as just someone that signs a paycheck. So they do just enough to not get fired and just enough to keep the manager away from there. You're going to see this later on in this paper. The first stage in the Nut Island effect is neglect. I briefly talked about this a minute ago, but basically in this first stage, the distant team slowly begins to receive decreased quality communication over time. As a result, the reinforced social cues and the reinforced social identity and the, everything else becomes minimized between the manager and the distant team. And the distant team in reaction begins to develop their own shared identity and shared goals, which in many cases can be different than what the manager has. Uh, don't forget the manager is off taking care of fires, uh, you know, miles away. So the team begins to get this autonomy where say, hey, well, we're pretty much running our own show, so we can basically define what we want to do. Unfortunately, because of in-group versus out-group biases, these goals sometimes become divergent from what the manager's goals are. And they begin to take on more of the local team goals like the, or the, like the local customer goals, which in my experience can be very different than the company goals. In this case, the team will do will focus on the local goals and do just enough of the manager goals to keep the manager from getting involved without raising the red flag. So the team goal so as a result of this, the team goals become more entrenched as a communication between 
the team and the manager decreases. And this is important because once again, we don't have this constant reinforcement. So you don't have the signal of what the goal should be, but you also don't have the signal of, hey, these are important goals. I need you to do these. In this stage, resentment, the team has become distant from the manager because the manager is basically beginning to ignore the team because he's got more high priority problems to take care of. And he basically views the team as a self-sufficient team that takes care of things. And I've heard it from many managers who mean, well, I'm not going to get involved unless I have to. They know the customer better than I do. Unfortunately, what that says is, hey, the team can do whatever they want as long as they don't cause any trouble. Well, the team will begin to start hiding trouble, unfortunately. Unfortunately, what also occurs is the team begins to have these low priority issues that, well, they're high priority issues to the team, but they're low priority to the manager. So the manager either satisfies it by basically doing something really quick to take care of the issue, but really doesn't take care of the issue, or they just ignore it altogether. Because once again, the manager's off taking care of high priority stuff. He's very tasked. In many cases, these managers are overtasked. They don't have the time to know their teams very well. So as a result, these managers basically put out fires. And they'll, it's a small fire, I'll, I'll put a, a small bucket of water on it. Well, the team is like, well, this is a big fire for us. But when these things happen a lot, the team begins to realize that the manager can't be trusted or that the manager is not there for them. So as a result of this absolution strategy, basically don't, in, don't get involved unless I have to, the team begins to take care of the problems themselves. And at the same time, when they take care of these problems, they hide the problems from the manager. In some cases, it can be harmless, but in extreme cases, these problems can cause more problems. I've seen instances where these patches to these problems by a local team actually causes more damage to equipment and personnel later down the line until eventually it can't be hidden anymore, in which case it's too late. Um, this is similar to what the Night Island Effects is about. The team members slowly begin to resent the manager lack of engagement in, in team problems, which increases the in-group biases that we mentioned earlier which reinforces perceived isolation from management. And once again, the organizational citizenship behaviors begin to become negative as well because as I always tell people, employees see the company through the manager's actions. If they have a poor manager, a perceived poor manager, they will view the company negatively. If they have a perceived strong manager, they'll view the company highly. As a result, OCB, organizational citizenship's behaviors, begin to suffer as well. And the team members begin to develop a heightened sense of self-importance where I'm the only one that understands a customer. I'm the only one that can deal with this. So I become um, unexpendable. I become where I can't be replaced. In the third stage, we get this underdog mentality where the team develops this us-against-the-world mentality. They feel that no one's on their side, so they have to bunker, um, bunker down and take care of problems themselves. Which you, This mentality is used to justify actions that are normally would not be justifiable because, hey, we got to take care of these problems and no one's on our side, so hey, I'm going to take care of the problems. And the manager feeds this because... I don't want to get involved unless I have to. And if the manager, manager does not hear anything, hey, okay, fine. I will continue to do what I want and as long as I can hide it from the manager. And the team managers and the team members begin covert actions to keep management from seeing how it operates. This is important. I've seen this once again, I've seen this dozens of times where the team begins to operate completely different than what they communicate to the manager. They give the manager just enough information for them to feel comfortable that they don't have to get involved. That's not a priority. So the manager goes off and does something else. And the team actually denies or minimizes problems to avoid management intervention. What's going to happen later on is the manager begins to have this bias of the team as this really effective team that takes care of things. So 
when something happens, they'll say, hey, team, what's what's up with this? And the team gives them an excuse. The manager is going to view that positively because of his bias of the team as a very effective team, even though the team may be very negative, uh, very ineffective or could be very damaging. So this is very important when you see managers do this. You know, Managers can very, be very biased towards this, these teams. Now the fourth stage is rulemaking. Eventually, in the later stages, they be, the team begins to create in, internal rules for socialization within the team on how we take care of problems. This is how we take care of things at our location. And we don't want to get the manager involved because we have this. The manager hasn't gotten involved before and we don't need the manager, so this is how we're going to take care of things. And they justify this by saying that this is a unique environment that requires these rules for us to be successful. And they use it to justify their perform their performance. And when you have deteriorating performance, they say, well, it would be much worse if we didn't do this. This det deteriorating performance is due to something that's outside of what we're doing or outside of, of what we have to do. And... As a result, when this deteriorating performance gets back to the manager, the manager will actually ignore these warning cues out of a desire to view the team as very effective and also because he's chasing high priority problems. He doesn't want to deal with these problems. So this is important to understand that teams will create rules and ways of communicating that will mask poor performance of a team. The last stage is homeostasis. And this basically homeostasis is where a harmony occurs, which is a long-term behavior in which the manager views the team as this high-performing team that's really good and effective. And the team views the manager as someone that they can't trust and is part of the out group. So they do whatever they can to keep the manager from getting involved. And the manager says, well, no news is good news. So I don't need to get involved. I got other things to take care of. So all of a sudden, this also creates a super par superstar persona in which team members begin to feel that, hey, we're the only ones that understand the customer. We're the only ones that understand this particular context. Therefore, they can't get rid of me because I'm very important. And this happens many times. And it's, once again, this is a human behavioral trait. All humans have this wired inside them. And this perception reinforces and condones future bad performance as well. So when they begin to go off the tracks, they justify it on, hey, this is what I have to do to take care of the customer. And outsider warnings that, are, that eventually get back to the manager are filtered out because the manager says, well, you, you may think that, but th that team's been there for a long time. They've been very effective. You obviously don't understand what they're doing. So the outsider who may blow the whistle will be ignored. And this happens in many cases where you have whistleblowers blow the whistle, but managers don't want to do anything because they have a perception that the team is effective. And these mental models continue until an external event forces a dissonance on both parties. That basically makes each which basically results in people getting fired, things getting broken or damaged. It's not very pretty. So recommendations for uh, avoiding this, or at least minimizing this. Develop a relationship with the team early. If you are a manager, spend some time before they go to this foreign location or this distant location and develop this shared identity because that shared identity is going to help you communicate social cues and shared communication with this team. It'll help reduce the in-group versus out-group biases that, that you'll, you'll see. It also improves communication. Communicate frequently at both the team and the individual level. Make sure that you talk using two-way communication as well because one-way communication can be very damaging to a relationship. I've seen many cases where managers are told, hey, you need to communicate more to a team. So it's all one way. Event, this actually amplifies the nut island effect by basically the team saying, okay, the manager is only going to call us when he wants something. So they begin to tune him out even more. So this is very dangerous. Make sure that you have two-way communication that has the right level and is also the right 
frequency so that you can maintain that shared identity and the shared goals and also make sure that you share timely communication about the larger team and larger organizational goals and identity so that the organization citizenship behaviors are more positive than they should be once again companies see the the employees see the company through the manager's behavior if the manager is engaged and effective and takes care of the team and communicates the company's willingness to help the employee, the team will feel that the, that the company is on their side. Vice versa, bad managers, perceive, well, perceived bad managers, result in, comp- in, in employees viewing the company bad, and they begin to view the company as just someone that signs a paycheck. And this is what happens in many cases. I've seen so many times when they have this this attrition where employees just leave the company. I recently saw where half of a team just suddenly left over one year period and the managers were left saying, well, why did this happen? This is a very hard thing. Once you get down to the later stages of the Nut Island effect, it's very hard to to recover from this. I hope that this presentation helps you understand distant team behaviors. I recommend that you read this paper if you're interested in this.